Natural selection works to mold species to better adapt them to fit in their environment. This is done through the effect of selection pressures acting on species over time. Sometimes, as we've learned in my previous videos, natural selection can work on a species and adapt them so much to their given environments that after a geographic isolation event has isolated their gene pool for long enough, they can evolve to become new species. As part of that adaptation to their new environment, oftentimes existing structures in these organisms change to be better adapted to function in that new environment. However, because they are the result of shared evolutionary origins, the structures, although different for, and perhaps serving even a different purpose for which they originally evolved, still contain the hallmarks of their evolutionary origins, and we can use these homologous structures to trace the evolutionary history of a species. Other times, selection pressures from different parts of the world acting on species from significantly different evolutionary origins can shape species to be remarkably similar despite the fact that there is no close evolutionary relationship. This result is a result of a process known as evolutionary convergence and results in analogous structures. In this video, we'll talk about where homologous and analogous structures come from and how they both serve to inform us better about evolution and how it shapes species. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Homologous structures and analogous structures are structures that we find in living things, and they are the product of evolutionary processes. Homologous structures are structures such as bones, organs, or genes that are incredibly complex in nature and are so similar in various species that they must be the result of common ancestry. Although they may not always serve the same purpose, or serve any purpose at all, as we'll see in the case of some vestigial structures. These homologous structures provide us with insight into how evolutionary processes have shaped species over time, as well as the evolutionary relationships between both existing and extinct species. On the other hand, analogous traits are the result of convergent evolution. Convergent evolution occurs when similar selection pressures act on entirely different species with the same net result in shaping the species to look very, very similar. In this video, we're going to examine both homologous and analogous structures and learn what they tell us about evolution and how evolution shapes species over time. First, we'll start with homologous structures. A great way to think of homologous structures is to look at the, the limb bone plan of all tetrapods. And when I refer to tetrapods, I'm referring to all things that currently have four limbs or are descendant from things with four limbs. So theoretically speaking, a snake technically falls into this tetrapod bin despite having no limbs whatsoever because they are descendant from tetrapods. We'll talk more on that when we talk about atavisms in a little bit. But if you look at the limb plan of any tetrapod, it's very simple. It's one bone, two bone, lots of blobs, digits. And if you think about it, your leg has the same organizational plan. One bone at the thigh, two bones, tibia and fibula, and lots of blobs, and then your digits, your toes at the end of your feet. That's the same whether you're looking at the wings of a bird, at the flippers of a whale, and the legs and, and hooves of a horse, or the webbed feet of a frog. That architecture, that bone architecture, is entirely preserved. Despite the fact that amphibians and horses and humans and bats for even have the same bone plan in their wing and, and, and whales have entirely different lifestyles, they all conserve the same organizational pattern of the tetrapod limb. Now, if you look at the number of bones that are present, if you look at the organization, it'd be really hard to argue that the fact that every bone in, the, in, these, in these bone plans is present just by sheer coincidence. The most logical explanation for why the bats of a wing, the arms and hands of a human, the legs of a horse, 
the flippers of a whale or a dolphin have the same bone plan is simply because they are all descendants from a single organism that at one point possessed that bone plan. And in fact, we actually have a treasure trove of fossil data showing when and how that bone plan developed almost 400 million years ago during the Devonian period in the earliest tetrapods. Now, one could argue, for example, that this was done through some act of special creation. But that begs the question, why would you put a bone structure like a human hand and hide it inside of a whale flipper? Why would you make wings of a bat look like a human hand, but change it so that the wings of a bird look entirely different? The answer is you really wouldn't do that. The most logical and plausible explanation for why all tetrapod limbs look the same is we're all descendants from a single tetrapod that had a very similar bone plan. And over time, evolution has shaped that bone plan to better serve species as they diversified into new species. The fossil record provides us with a detailed understanding of how these bone plans adapted over time. For example, if you look at the wing of any modern day bird, you will see that one bone, two bone, lots of blob digit plan. Many of the bones have been greatly reduced or rearranged in some cases. But you can actually look back through the fossil record and watch the evolution of birds' wings over time. You can trace them back into the Jurassic period and start to see what early bird-like ancestors look like. You can trace it even farther back and see how the earliest bone structures of raptor-like dinosaurs provided the groundwork for the evolution of the wings of modern-day birds. You could also trace the evolution of mammalian ears and jaws from reptilian jaws and ears using a very similar approach by examining the fossil record. And this is where homologous structures come from. They are the result of existing structures being molded, in other cases, exapted for new purposes. The original purpose of those limbs from dinosaurs was to be the front legs of quadrupedal dinosaurs, of the earliest tetrapods. Eventually, some began walking upright. Those arms were greatly reduced. And over time, some of them turned them into wing-like structures. If we look at some of the earliest flying bird-like reptiles like Archaeopteryx, and we can see the, the formation of those homologous structures into a modern-day looking bird wing. Finally, we can look at a modern day bird and see how those, those bones have been exapted for a new purpose. The key thing to remember about homologous structures is that when we look at homologous structures, it's the conservation of the structure that's important, not necessarily the con conservation of the function of that particular structure. So for example, the same bones that are used in our human hands for grasping are the same bones that participate in flight for birds, are the same bones that participate in flight for bats, are the same bones used as flippers for whales and dolphins. But the structure itself is conserved in terms of this organization. And the, in, the relative complexity of these structures make it highly, highly unlikely they would have evolved independently to look that similar. Now, in some cases, these homologous structures have entirely lost their function altogether. In this case, we would refer to those homologous structures as vestigial structures. Now, I, I must point out that vestigial structures don't need to be useless to be considered vestigial. For example, ostrich wings, they're not used for flight anymore. They're still considered a vestigial structure, despite the fact that they've been repurposed to be utilized to help them steer at high speeds and to maintain their balance. But nevertheless, they're considered a vestigial structure because they're a wing not used for flight. Other times, vestigial structures have been rendered completely useless. For example, if we look at the wings of a kiwi. Nope, that's still a kiwi fruit. Could you please put up a picture of a real kiwi? Okay, thank you. If you look at the wings of the kiwi, you can see that they're virtually non-existent. In fact, when you look at them without fluffing the fur up, you can't see them at all. And just like the wings of all flightless birds, one could argue that these particular organisms that are flightless birds would be significantly better off not having any wings and instead having even getting their raptor-like arms back. But that can't happen because evolution can't go backwards in that particular context. <clears throat> so why then do they have wings if they're non-flying birds? 
it's simple. They're the evolutionary remnants from their ancestors of when they used to fly as birds. And we see this time and time again when we look at the thousands of different flightless bird species on islands throughout the world. Or we look at the ratites, the emus, the rheas, and the ostriches, the large flightless birds. Again, you're looking at species who would arguably be better off having forelimbs of some type, even if they were little tiny Tyrannosaurus rex arms. But they don't have those because they are the descendants of birds and their homologous structures, those wings, despite being vestigial, give them away. The same can be said for our appendix. Why do we have an appendix? And it's simple. We're mammals, and all mammals have an appendix. Ours is just vestigial in the fact that it's pretty much useless. Now, again, some immunologists would argue that the appendix does play a role in maintaining our normal microbiota by housing healthy bacteria. But that's not the purpose for which it evolved. If you look at functional appendices in other organisms, they're there to help break down roughage, plant, uh, plant material, and things like that. But since our diet is no longer rich in nuts and plants and so on and so forth, our appendix is functionally useless. And in fact, it's kind of like a ticking time bomb in a significant proportion of us because at some point it's going to get clogged and potentially explode and kill us if we, if we don't get it removed before that happens or we're not treated after it happens. But again... The appendix serves as a reminder of our evolutionary past, that we are related to all of those things that have an appendix because we are, like them, mammals descended from mammalian ancestors who had a functional appendix. Sometimes we see the reemergence of homologous structures that we thought had gone away through our evolutionary, through our evolutionary history. Atavisms are the recapitulation of an ancestral trait. Occasionally, a snake is actually born with a leg or multiple legs. Occasionally, a human being is born with a tail. Now, when you see these atavistic structures reemerge, oftentimes they don't look complete. They don't look functional. And, the, and, and you're right. They're probably not functional for the most part. Because what you have to think about is this. The reason those structures can reappear in the first place is the molecular programming. The genes to make snake legs or to make a human tail are still present. However, because those structures no longer exist in a normal body plan for a snake in the case of legs or a tail in the case of humans, those structures are no longer under selection pressure. And what did we learn about structures that are no longer under selection pressure? They tend to degrade over time. Why? Because remember, there are way more ways to get worse than there are to get better. So those genes have degraded over time. So when they accidentally get turned on, they brush the cobwebs off and they make the best snake leg they possibly can, but it's not a good one. They make the best human tail they possibly can, but again, it's not a good one. But again, the fact that these atavistic structures can reemerge from time to time is proof of the evolutionary history of these organisms. It's proof that we are descendant from primates that, for the most part, have tails. Our tail bones just happen to fuse together to form a coccyx typically our tailbone, prior to birth. It's a reminder that snakes are descendant from four-legged tetrapods. They just happen to lose those by adapting to their new lifestyle of slithering from point A to point B with no legs. Speaking of genetics, genes can also serve as homologous structures. Now, while genes aren't necessarily structures per se, we still refer to them as homologous structures because they are a great way of following our evolutionary history. It's only been in the last 30 to 40 years since the advent of gene sequencing. And in the last 10 to 20 years with the advent of high efficiency, high throughput, low cost sequencing, that we're beginning to really use genetics as a way of following the evolutionary history of organisms. One of the things that we can observe in all multicellular animals is a group of genes known as the Hox genes or homeobox genes. Hox genes are found in all multicellular organisms. And one of the very interesting thing about Hox genes is that they are essential for advanced body plans. It turns out that Hox genes encode proteins that control the spatiotemporal planning of development. They basically decide what genes are supposed to be on and where those genes are supposed to be on during the developmental process. And mutations in these Hox genes can lead to, lead to some pretty bizarre effects. Nevertheless, one of the things that we can see is a high degree of conservation of where these genes are located in our genome as well as how they function 
to regulate our developmental patterning. The other thing that we've seen with Hox genes is that they've undergone several rounds of gene duplications throughout evolutionary history. These gene duplications are incredibly important, and we won't get into the details of gene duplications today, but we will talk later on about how gene duplications are both necessary and important for the diversification of body plants in multicellular organisms. We'll talk about how they're needed to, to create advanced structures and advanced molecular pathways through natural processes of evolution. One great example of how we can use gene homologies to follow an evolutionary path is to look at the GULO pseudogene found in primates. So GULO, if you recall from one of my previous videos, is a gene whose protein that it encodes is an enzyme that's essential for making vitamin C. We refer to this gene as psi GULO in all primates because it is a pseudogene. This gene is broken. While most other mammals are possess GULO that is functional and are able to make their own vitamin C, primates cannot. So one of the things we have to first think about is why would primates have a pseudogene for making vitamin C. Why would that gene be allowed to degrade and become non-functional? Simple. Primates evolved in a world where their diet had plenty of vitamin C in it. Therefore, there was no selection pressure on the GULO gene to continue to function. There are more ways to get worse than there are to get better. A series of mutations rendered the gene product non-functional. And in fact, when you look at Psi GULO in all primates, we all share six gene mutations, whether you're a gorilla or an orangutan or a chimpanzee or a human, we all have six GULO mutations in common. And these were likely the original six that rendered GULO a pseudogene and made it non-functional. But then if you look at Psi GULO just in orangutans, you will notice that the orangutans have several other mutations in their GULO gene that is not shared by any other primate. So what that tells us from an evolutionary perspective is those mutations must have arisen in the orangutan lineage after the original six that rendered GULO in all primates a pseudogene and after the divergence of orangutan lineage from the remainder of primates. Because we don't see something like this in other primates, it tells us that the orangutans were likely the first group of primates to branch off from the common ancestor of all the other primates. Now, if we look at Psi GULO in gorillas, they have three unique mutations that only gorillas possess. Chimpanzees and humans don't have them. Orangutans don't have them. So what that tells us is these three mutations must have arisen after the original six, after orangutans broke off from the primate lineage, and after gorillas had broken away from the lineage that would eventually give rise to chimpanzees and humans. Then if we look at chimpanzees, they also have three mutations unique unto themselves that gorillas don't have and humans don't have. Of course, that means those mutations must have arisen after the original six, after orangutans broke away, after gorillas broke away from the main primate lineage, and sometime after the chimpanzee human lineage split. If we look at human side GULO, we have 11. If we look at human side GULO, we find that there are 15 mutations that only humans possess that no other primate has. And what that tells us is those 15 mutations in our Psi GULO must have occurred after the human and chimpanzee lineage split sometime around 7 million years ago. This is a great example of how we can use gene homologies to follow the evolutionary path of organisms. And of course, all of what we've learned from the molecular data is also matched by what we find, for example, in the fossil record or where we compare anatomical and physiologic similarities. And that's the key to tracing the evolutionary history of species. 
you use multiple points of reference. And then when they all agree, it's very, very unlikely the evolution of those species could have happened in any other way. So now let's turn to analogous structures. From time to time, we look at species and we see that they share similar behaviors, similar structures. But when we look at them from a microscopic point of view or from a subsurface point of view, we realize that despite the fact, for example, that many species have the ability to fly, bat wings are significantly different from the wings of insects. These are a great example of analogous structures. Analogous structures are the result of similar selection pressures acting on different species of different evolutionary origins. One way, if you think about it, analogous structures are kind of the opposite of homologous st structures. Because with homologous structures, they are the result of shared ancestry. They have a similar structure, but may have entirely different functions. On the other hand, analogous structures are not the result of shared ancestry. And they usually have entirely different structural basis, but perform the same function. And the way I like to think of analogous structures is this. Analogous structures are evolutionarily good ideas. It turns out the ability to fly is a pretty powerful advantage in a, for a lot of different reasons, both for defense, for finding food, and for traveling. Lots of benefits to flying. So of course, it makes sense that flight would have evolved at least four times that we know about in the history of animals. Another great example of an analogous structure comes from when we look at new world cacti and old world euphorbia. If you look at both of these, you might not even be able to distinguish them from each other. Um, the best way to distinguish them from each other from, from the eye perspective is to know whether you're looking at something growing in an American desert or an African desert or a Middle Eastern desert, for example. Euphorbia live in the old world and uh, cacti from the new world. But it turns out that if you are a flowering plant that lives in a desert, it's a good idea to have a thick, round, water-retaining trunk, reduce your leaves into spikes, have a thick cuticle that, keeps, that prevents you from losing water, and a wide, shallow root network. Both of these species have reached this particular body plan as a result of similar selection pressures. They're not particularly closely related to each other on a genetic level or on an evolutionary level. They're descendants from entirely different species. The nearest you can say is they're both flowering plants, but the result of natural selection working on them shaped them to be remarkably similar. Same thing is true for aquatic species. So for example, if you're looking at a dolphin or a porpoise or a whale, and then compare that to the body plan of say a penguin, which is an aquatic bird, compare that to a shark, which is a fish, and compare that to an ichthyosaur, which is an, which is an extinct uh, aquatic reptile, you can see the remarkable similarity in the body plan. This is not the result of shared ancestry. It is the result, on the other hand, of shared selection pressures. It turns out that if you make your living in the water, the best shape to be is kind of shaped like a torpedo or a submarine. It makes you hydrodynamic. It allows you to move faster at the expense of less energy. If you move faster, you can find prey faster and get away from predators. It turns out that's just the best shape to be. And this acts on all aquatic species, fish, mammal, bird, or reptile that live in the water. One of the coolest examples I can think of is to look at the continent of Australia. The continent of Australia is inhabited predominantly by marsupial mammals. It's a world of marsupials, and there are very, very few in indigenous placental mammals around. But because Australia is a full continent and has all of the ecological niches as almost every other continent on the planet inhabited by placental mammals, marsupials have evolved to fill those niches with stunning similarity in terms of their body plan, and they all have some type of placental equivalent. Just look at this chart here, and you can see, for example, uh, for example, there is a placental flying squirrel that's matched by the marsupial sugar glider. And you can see how remarkably similar the body plans are. And they are quite simply the result of similar selection pressures acting to shape species to look remarkably similar, despite the fact that they really don't share a recent common ancestor. Convergent evolution, which leads to the formation of analogy, analogous structures, shows us just how powerful natural forces are in shaping species. And they give us clues, just as homologous structures do, into the evolutionary past of the organisms that possess them.
Thanks so much for tuning in today. We talked about homologous and analogous structures, two different things we find in living organisms that give us clues to their evolutionary past. Homologous structures are the result of shared ancestry, whereas analogous structures are the result of shared selection pressures acting on totally different species. I hope you found today's information interesting. I hope you learned a lot and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.